Uh, Professor Gina Rippon is an international researcher in the field of cognitive neuroscience based at the Aston Brain Center at Aston University in Birmingham. Her research involves the use of state-of-the-art brain imaging techniques to investigate developmental disorders such as autism. She is a regular contributor to events such as the British Science Festival, New Scientist Live, and the Skeptics in the Pub series. In 2015, she was made an honorary fellow of the British Science Association for her contributions to the public communication of science. She is also an advocate for initiatives to help overcome the underrepresentation of women in STEM subjects. As part of a European Union gender equality network, she has addressed conferences all over the world. Her book, Gender in Our Brains, How New Neuroscience Explodes the Myth of the Male and Female Minds, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Gina Rippon. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me here. I can't actually see any of you, but there seems to be quite a lot of you, so thank you very much for coming. Um, as was mentioned, uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the book that I've just written, but the focus you'll probably be pleased to hear is not just about the book, it's why I wrote the book, the science behind um, the story that I'm telling in the book, and why I think it's actually important. Um, the book uh, is called, it's just been released in the States, it's called Gender and Our Brains. Um, it's called something different in the UK, it's called The Gendered Brain. Um, the US publishers said they didn't think the American audience could cope with the term gendered. <laughs> I'm afraid my, res my response was, as a nation which seems to spend a lot of its time changing nouns into verbs, I'd be really surprised. But anyway, um, okay, so two, two books for the price of one. Uh, it's called Gender and Our Brains, and the subtitle, How Your World Makes Up Your Mind. And that's really to give you now, if you like, the take-home message, which I think we need to look very carefully at the world in which our brains function, because I think it has a much greater impact on our brains than we ever realised, and that's what 21st century brings to this argument. Now, the book is called Gender and Our Brains, and that gives a bit of a clue about the particular difference that I'm interested in. But in fact, uh, my, my journey, if you like, started because I was very interested in how any brains get to be different. Um, as was mentioned, I'm principally an autism researcher, and there's a great saying in the autism community that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, <laughs> and having spent a lot of time doing research looking at uh, a whole range of individuals, um, all given the sort of label autistic, and realising how different their brains were. I thought we really need to find out about individual differences in the brain and how they get to be like that. And so I thought, OK, well, the first thing to do is actually um, to ask the question about the sort of fundamental differences that we already know about. OK, so I think this is this way just find out this doesn't move now. <laughs> Should I be pointing this at something? Or... Oh, right, it's one of those. OK. <laughs> right, we'll get back to where I started, hopefully. Um, that's really to give you um, an idea of my credentials, if you like. I work in the Aston Brain Centre. We have all sorts of uh, different brain imaging techniques. We're very fortunate to have all the contemporary ones. Um, as you can see, it's... Um, a very old picture of me with a very small daughter discovering the dangers of having a mother as a neuroscientist. Um, <laughs> she did seem to have survived anyway, um, so far. Um, and we also have the classic fMRI systems, uh, which most people are familiar with. Um, and we also have a very unusual system called magnetoencephalography. But basically, we have all sorts of different ways of looking at the brain, both structures and functions. And we can produce these amazing images with which uh, you will be familiar. They tend to, to um, grace a lot of popular discussion about the brain as well as, as being found in, in more obscure neuroscience journals. They are amazingly... I, I love showing these pictures because I think they're wonderful how we can show a whole, in a whole range of different ways what the brain can do. But as we'll see later, sometimes they're part of the uh, problem as well as being part of the um, solution. OK, so... Let's have a quick look at what this argument is about. And that is really to say, what is the particular difference that we're looking at? 
how do female brains get to be different from male brains? Because I was interested in brain difference, I thought, let's have a look at the best established brain difference we know about that everybody agrees on. There's a female brain and a male brain, and they're different, and that has all kinds of consequences. And the underlying story was something along the lines of biology is destiny. You, you have the brain you're born with, and that is determined biologically, and the route that that brain takes through life is pretty fixed, um, the end point is pretty inevitable, and it doesn't vary that much. So you get... Um, I can move away from here, can't I, because I've got this on. I can actually show you that. Sorry, I suddenly, I've been told to stand by the microphone, and I realise now I've got this on, I can actually move, which should be easier. OK, so what we're looking at is something like a male brain here, arrives in the world, perhaps with some of the skills it might need uh, to become the uh, superior individual that it will be. Um, <laughs> And as it grows bigger, it gets more of those skills, and eventually um, it becomes um, a superior, completely superior organ, which will drive the superior individual through the world. <laughs> the other sort of brain, slightly smaller, and we'll come back to that, doesn't perhaps have so many of the skills that um, might have made it a leader of, of, of people. Um, <laughs> have to be sure that it doesn't get exposed to dangers of a higher education. Uh, we'll see <laughs> a bit later that early thinking about women was pretty rude, and we'll, we will come back to that. Um, but it then moved on to be talking about complementary skills, so that you didn't want to risk women's brains being damaged by higher education, because that would prevent them being able to reproduce, literally. Um, so you get this brain which does grow, but doesn't necessarily acquire too many skills. So we immediately have, and this is quite emotional brain, very good at, um, <laughs> at looking at emotions, etc., understanding, being empathic. And so we knew fairly, fairly clearly that there were two types of brain, um, and even to the extent that there's two types of books written about it. OK, so we have the male brain and the female brain, and that was pretty well established. And even right up to the end of the last century, there was a belief that there were two sorts of brain. And so I thought this was a good way to understand how brains got to be different, because we knew these brains were different, so let's have a look at the, the chain of argument. OK, reminder that this is actually a very old issue, up to 200 years ago, and possibly longer, but in terms of actually thinking about the brain. And it didn't used to be a question. It wasn't, are men's and women's brains different? It was a statement. Men's and women's brains are different. It was a slightly more uh, challenging statement than that, because, in fact, the emerging uh, neuroscience uh, science and the practitioners of neuroscience looked at society, looked at the status quo, and said, clearly, women are inferior to men because they're socially inferior, educationally inferior, etc. So what we need to do is to find the measure which will explain the brain's role in this inferiority. So they were starting out to find out that women's brains basically were inferior. And you get an idea of the particularly, perhaps, lack of objectivity these <laughs> scientists had with respect to the people they were studying. So uh, women represent the most inferior forms of human evolution and are closer to children and savages than to an adult civilized man. Um, and another charming um, protagonist at the time, uh, Le Bon, uh, said that you could occasionally get quite bright women, but it was so rare, um, it was actually uh, like a gorilla with two heads. And in fact, I did want to call my book The Problem of the Two-Headed Gorilla, but again, the um, publishers thought perhaps that was a bit not serious enough. Um, <laughs> So we have issues here where what was actually the history of... And I had great fun exploring the different ways in which these scientists were trying to prove that women's brains were inferior. Remembering, of course, that we couldn't actually look at the live brain. We could look at dead brains. We could look at the consequences, perhaps, of damaged or diseased brains. But we didn't have a really good idea about how the brain worked. Early studies, for example, you could take an empty skull and fill it with bird seed, weigh the bird seed, um, and get an idea about how, the, how big the brain that was in that skull might have been. Big excitement initially because it was found on average, and we'll come back to that because that's important, men's brains were five ounces heavier than women's. Um, and so that was the solution. Having a bigger brain made you intelligent, and that's why men were more intelligent than women. And then somebody spoiled sport 
pointed out that sperm whales and elephants, for example, also have big brains, bigger brains than human men, and generally they're not renowned for being more intelligent. <laughs> so what we then found was a big effort on the part of these scientists. And it's really, I mean, it, it, it is quite funny to look at, but it does make you realize that the kind of measures we use are something that we ought to be aware of. Because the idea was the success of these measures was based on the kind of chain of, of success that they, that they measured, so that you could have, as long as you could have white, and it intersected with, uh, with race as well, upper class, educated men at the top of whatever scale that metric generated, with women next, and then the lower classes, and then other races lower, that was a measure of that particular, uh, the success of that measure. So all sorts of weird things like feeling bumps on the skull or, or looking at angles. So really we need to be aware that the uh, science of this particular hunt the difference agenda, as I've called it, um, was firmly placed in, in a political context. It was looking at society, trying to explain a status quo. So it's an old question. But it's actually a question that remains very important and which generates a lot of excitement. So that um, if, you, if I, as a neuroscientist, see in some kind of obscure neuroscience journal there's a whiff of a sex difference in a paper, um, maybe there's all sorts of other things as well, but you know, perhaps the head, heading has a sex difference. You'll know that within, certainly in the UK and possibly in the US as well, within... Uh, two to three weeks of that paper coming out, all of a sudden the popular press will get excited and you'll get headlines, men's and women's brains, the truth. And that's always the kind of phrasing, you know, the proof at last, truth at last, uh, men's and women's brains, the truth. And you kind of wonder what the end of that sentence might be. Men have bigger brains than women, research reveals. Um, and we'll come back to that as well. But the idea is that this appears to be very important, so important that the press wish to remind us all the time that science is, is, is bolstering up this belief that men's and women's are different, uh, brains are different, um, and fantastic the success that they're having. Okay. So effectively, we're looking at what looks like a, a very simple chain of argument, Whatever it is that made men's and women's bodies different, and the early researchers obviously didn't know about genotypes, but effectively they were aware that men and women had different anatomies. Whatever it was that determined that also determined the fact that they had different brains. And if they had different brains, then, and the experimental psychologists weighed in there as well, then they had different skills, different temperaments, different personalities, and that meant that they could do different jobs or have different places in society, or perhaps couldn't do a job at all because you know their brains weren't appropriate. So if you had a female brain, um, and this was inextricably linked to the fact that you had a female body, that meant that you were uh, great at empathy, uh, but rubbish at reading maps. Um, whereas if you had a male brain, again, inextricably linked to the male body, then you were very good at uh, sort of spatial, science-y type tasks, but not very good at listening or understanding emotion. And that particular set of skills gave you a particular role in society. Remembering, of course, that the early scientists, as I've said, were working backwards from that chain of argument, but it's presented to us in, in this order mainly. So there's a nice unfolding idea um, that's well established. And the idea is that these two brains, uh, like bodies, are so-called dimorphic. So there's either a male brain or a female brain. But remember that all of these conclusions were reached before we really knew what the brain was actually like. We, we, again, we were still basing this on looking at consequences of brain damage, etc. So moving on, we need to say, so what happened next? Long pause while the slide... There must be very big slides. It's taking a long time to load. My apologies. OK. So 1990s brain imaging arrives. And what we find is um, all of a sudden we feel that we do have direct access to what's going on in the brain. We can put uh, a living human being in a scanner. We can give them any range of tasks. We can ask them questions. We can play the music, whatever we like. And we can generate these amazing images, which are a way of communicating that activity, which appear very immediate. And so at last we think, oh, we know whereabouts in the brain language is. We know what happens when somebody's... Um, looking at a picture or trying to remember a list of words, etc. But in fact, the trouble was with those, books, those particular images was that 
They are the end result of the long, long chain of quite complicated statistical uh, analysis of different kind of image manipulation, not in any way fraudulent, but just making sure that the story the scientist was trying to tell was clear. So it looks as though there's an amazing bit of the brain lights up there when you're asking somebody to do something. Not realizing that these are actually uh, made to emphasize differences because the brain is active all the time. Um, the old myths about 10% of the brain, only using 10% of the brain are, are way past their cell-by date. Our brain is very active. And to define these differences, you really have to do a, a lot of image manipulation. But what happened was that people who, at that stage, were um, very keen in um, what we call um, a sort of looking at um, relationship uh, gurus, for example, self-help books, there was a big wave of those books which hijacked these wonderful images. They'd had these theories about men and women being different. We had the female brain, seen that before. Men are from Mars. We can go back one for that. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Something, that every book that everybody seems familiar with um, had a very powerful impact because it felt that at last, the truth, again, uh, we could understand why men and women were different. It was because the neuroscientists approved it. And these books got filled with lots and lots of these sort of images, often with not very clear explanations of where they came from. Um, and also, like, with no axes or anything. But all you need to look is it. there's a big, you know, the man has a piece of the brain there which lights up, whereas it's that part of the brain which the women's lights up. Doesn't that look different? Unfortunately, that really was an era when neuroscience was very badly misrepresented, misunderstood. Um, in the female brain, for example, there's a long piece which is about how men and women use language differently, and it's got a sort of science, science type quotations and references. If you actually go and find the references and look at them very carefully, all of that research was actually done on songbirds. Um, <laughs> so we do know a lot about songbirds, but actually perhaps not that informative about the human race. But never mind. And the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is these books really inform belief. They sustain stereotypes. They actually uh, don't diminish them in any way. People say that neuroscience has shown, and neuro used to be, you could call, in the beginning of this century, neuro became the, the prefix that was put in front of anything that wanted to be serious. So you had neurophilosophy and neuroliterature. Even neuro kitchen cab cabinetry was something I came across. Um, you can ask me about that afterwards. So I call this unashamedly neurotrash, and I feel it's something that we should be aware of because it did actually inform a lot of what we were talking about. OK, the other thing that scientists themselves didn't say, now is the chance for a clean sheet. We'll go and look at the original thoughts we had about brains of any kind, but particularly perhaps male and female brains, really look into the basics, the fundamentals of this issue. They continued with the hunt the difference agenda. They continued to say, let's find how our techniques can prove that men and women are different. And we get books uh, a bit like this. Uh, this one's called The Essential Difference. Um, and essential is an interesting word. Language is interesting in this area. So essential, in this case, really means biological essence. So something about your biology gives you particular qualities or characteristics. But if you stopped anybody in the street and said, what do you think the word essential means? They'd probably say, well, really, really important, something that we have to have. And it's important to realize that this issue still underpins a lot of what we're, we're thinking about and why it's important to understand it. So this book, for example, starts the female brain is... So there is a female brain, because we're saying that that's what it is. It's hardwired, underlined, so fixed, for empathy. Uh, the male brain is hardwired for understanding systems. So clear statement in a very popular book, which informs a lot of research in the area. It is only later on in the book that Simon Baron Cohen, the author, says, of course, you don't actually have to be a woman to have a female brain or a man to have a male brain, at which point you think, this is an area where language really matters. Um, <laughs> if you're talking about this kind of brain, why are you calling it a female brain? Because, of course, it continues to sustain the stereotypes. Right, so... We've arrived at a time where we've got an idea of actually what's going on um, 
you know, looking at this old question, it's still not being addressed as a question, it's being taken as a given. So what I really wanted to do is to say, I think there's some really important questions in this area. First of all, are there any sex differences in the brain? Fairly fundamental issue. Neuroscientists do have the tools to find out. And certainly if you looked at the literature, if you had a quick scan over all the abstracts, you think there's thousands of papers in this area. Look how many are reporting differences. So that proves there are differences. But again, if you drill down a bit, you find that although there are differences reported, they're not often the same differences. So you can get one set of papers will report that men have bigger amygdala or bigger hippocampus, part of the brain we'll come back to, and then another study will come along, come along and say, well, we've looked at all the papers measuring the amygdala and the hippocampus looking for sex differences. We've looked at the effect size, how big these differences are, and we haven't actually, um, we haven't actually found the same differences so I'd have to say, and you might think, so what have you neuroscientists been doing all this time? Um, that there is no consistent structure in the brain, pattern of networks, um, uh, different characteristics which reliably distinguish a man's brain from a woman's brain. So I can't, couldn't look at a brain image and say, oh, I know that's... Um, from a man or that's from a woman, a bit like those police procedures where you know, somebody picks up a bone and says, oh, you know, that's a 34-year-old woman who had two children and likes gin or something. Um, <laughs> we can't do that with brains. I mean, you could have a pretty good guess, and they're now starting to look at pattern recognition techniques with machine learning, and they're talking proudly about the fact that you can distinguish brains with sort of 80% probability. And you think, we're talking about brains which you claim, you know, the literature and the history has claimed, a dimorphic, a male brain, a male brain, and a female brain. And if it's not that easy to distinguish them, we maybe should look, at, look back at that dichotomy. Um, so that's important to remember. The other thing that's important to remember... Um, and I think this was one of the slides that got lost at the beginning, was what we're talking about when we're talking about differences. Um, I don't know if you can see here, you've got two um, overlapping curves of data. Now, if you take uh, two groups of people, male and female, and run them through any sort of test, behavioural or brain imaging, you will find that you get characteristic um, data like that. So big amount of variability within each group, if you put the data on the same axis, you'll find a huge amount of overlap. So the differences we're talking about are actually very tiny. They may be statistically significant, but if you've got a big enough data set, but they're actually very small. And what we ignore, and this is where sort of my autism research interest came in, we ignore the variability within each group. So the differences within groups of males and females are much bigger than the differences between them. And even dyed-in-the-wool sex difference um, uh, researchers will acknowledge that actually the differences they're talking about are quite small. But again, with respect to how these are reported, um, this is a, a, a quite a famous study, um, famous in terms of the fact that it was one of the first which reported uh, connectivity differences within the brain, so not just structures, uh, because it's important to remember that we don't really have a very clear way of mapping structures onto function. We don't really know what having a bigger amygdala means. It may well be we're collecting lots and lots of data, a bit like the craniology measures, which are actually not that important for solving the problem we're trying to address. But this particular paper was looking at wiring diagrams and saying that, oh, there's a big difference between male brains, which are connected more strongly anterior to posterior, and female brains connected more strongly across the hemispheres. What they didn't say was that these were 100-plus pathways where they did find a difference, and this is the biggest difference of any of the pathways they compared. What they didn't say, that it was more than... I think it was 100,000 pathways they compared, where they found no difference at all. So you're starting to think, what are we actually looking here? If we've got tiny differences, maybe they're important, but there's a huge amount of similarities between the two and a huge amount of variability within the groups. But these, these scientists were talking about fundamental sex differences. So again, not necessarily to diss neuroscience, but just to say we need to be careful... Um, <laughs> We need to be careful um, that we're not feeding into this idea of stereotypes. I could move on quickly before the whole thing dies. <laughs> not quick enough. Okay. Any chance we can get that back? Oh, 
Right, interesting colour. Okay. Um, right, well, I'll work through. <laughs> so you might say, so what actually has 21st century neuroscience brought to this? Is there a different perspective we might be able to use in order to understand it? And the answer is, hopefully, yes. They're now moving of their own accord. They've obviously given up me trying to press a button. Sorry about this. <laughs> uh, right, this one needs to go back. What I'm... Th <laughs> Absolutely taken on a life of their own, this lot. <laughs> OK, right. It's giving you clues as to what's coming next, which perhaps is interesting. OK. I will get back to the slide, hopefully. It's obviously determined to be on that one. That's really to say that there's what I call the three Ps in brain science, which we should understand a better way of actually addressing these issues. And that is the fact that our brains are predictive, they are plastic, and they are permeable. And what those mean is that, and this is very much related to my work with autism, the brain is not just a fantastic, amazing information processing system, just receiving information and processing it. We now know that the brain is actually much more like a, a predictive texture or a high-end sat-nav which anticipates traffic jams, etc. The brain generates rules. It finds out predictability in the information that it's processing. So it knows when it hears a particular sound what the rest of the sound is likely to be, or a sight, or perhaps an emotional expression to go into sort of higher level forms. And so the brain is actually interacting with the world all the time in order to gather the rules to drive its owner safely through that world. That's important to remember, because it means the world will have much more of an impact than we were ever aware. The other thing that's important to remember is that our brains are very flexible, but only within the last 30 years or so have we realized that that flexibility carries on throughout life, that our brains will change according to the kind of experiences we have. We knew that very small babies' brains were quite plastic and flexible, and that they, you could see the changes as they learned different techniques, etc. But we didn't realize the same was true for adults until we started using brain imaging techniques. And this is an example looking at taxi drivers in London who have a very complicated uh, process called the knowledge, where they have to learn the 20,000 uh, routes within six miles of Charing Cross. Always a useful piece of fact if you want to get into a black cab in London. You know, tell them taxi drivers' brains are amazing. Um, and then they'll get you where you want to be a lot quicker and perhaps not expect such a big tip. Um, but what we're looking at here is the fact that this, this was a whole group of, of studies looking at taxi drivers before they uh, started on this really complicated learning process, which takes three or four years uh, on average, six years for some, lots of people fail. But what they showed was that as they acquired the knowledge, these particular parts of their brain changed in shape, uh, grew larger. As they drove those taxis, that, that difference remained. But interestingly, once they retired, those differences disappeared. So it's a really nice measure of the fact that our brains are very plastic and respond to experiences they have. But of course, also it means that if they don't have those experiences, the brains won't change. And finally, the brains are also very, so very sensitive to social context, the context in which that information is presented. Um, and there's a social psychology process called stereotype threat, which is if you're a member of a, a group which has a reputation for not doing well at something, and I look at um, girls in maths, for example, then very often, if that's drawn to their attention, and they're put in a situation, for example, doing a maths test, they will perform worse than they should do if you understand their the sort of performance skills. And you can actually show the way, and that will not only affect behavior, but also changes the brain. And this particular study was looking at three groups of women. One of them were given a task, a mental rotation task, which we'll come back to, and said, this is a task which uh, women find very difficult, but not to worry about that. I'm going to put you in the scanner and see what happens to your brain. Another had a neutral message, and the third group had a positive message. This is a mental rotation task, and uh, women are generally very good at it if they think of it as perspective-taking, and I want to see what happens when you put you in the scanner. 
And you get the predicted pattern of errors, so the ones with the negative message made most mistakes, the ones with the positive least mistakes. But what was interesting was that their brains reflected that too. So the ones with the positive message, the appropriate areas of the brain were activated, they solved the problem and did well. Whereas those who were given exactly the same task, but in a different social context, if you like, or, or given different expectations. There was activity in the brain much more associated with, as we'll see, um, as you've already seen, actually, the um, uh, part of the brain which, which activates, uh, is activated when you make mistakes um, and when you're getting negative feedback from the, the sort of feedback loops in your brain. So exactly the same process, but it will respond differently in a, um, in a social context. I'll see if we can get this without, hurrah, breaking the, <laughs> breaking the projector. Now, I won't go into this in detail, you'll be pleased to hear, and probably the projection, projectionist may well too. Um, and that's really the fact that what is our brain for? And a new way of thinking about the brain in the 21st century is acknowledging that we all thought our cognitive superiority, which arose from this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, uh, evolutionary, the newest part of the brain, and, and proportionally biggest in humans, so we're cognitively superior, we solve problems and, uh, and we can be uh, um, uh, coolly logical and work out a problem and hence the picture of, of um, Sherlock Holmes, or we can be amazingly scientifically creative, hence Einstein. What we now know is that this part of the brain is also important for something we're starting to realise is a really important human uh, success, and that is the fact that we're social. The fact that we, as a human... Uh, as as humans, we have the largest number of social networks, we solve problems collaboratively, we have the largest numbers of people within those social networks, um, and it's a worldwide phenomenon, and it's also very closely associated with the, this increase in sociability with the increase in the prefrontal cortex. So understanding social scripts, understanding your own self-identity, uh, being aware of social rules, um, looking at in-groups and out-groups, working out which group you belong to, what the rules of those groups were, is a very important part of the brain. And that is guided by the same processes which guide everything in the brain. And we like to think that we have emerged, as Sherlock Holmes, coolly logical, but everything we do is actually coloured by emotion. And hence the link to these little Pixar figures down here. If we make a mistake, we get a feeling of sadness, negative feeling. If something goes right, or we, you know, we're accepted by our in-group, it feels good. And there's a part of the brain which is what most of my research focuses on, which is a bit like a traffic light system. Um, it's, a called, it's part of the brain here called the anterior cingulate cortex, and it bridges evolutionary these two parts of the brain, the new part and the old emotional part, and they act like a traffic light system. So if you do something which is wrong, um, that system will stop you doing it again. If you make some kind of mistake, it will drive you away from that pattern of behavior. And that's important to hang on to, because it means we have a system in the brain which will guide you away from things which result in mistakes and will drive you towards things which will make you feel good. So hang on to that, uh, my little uh, traffic lights or inner limiter. Um, the next part of the slides, hurrah. Um, now, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Again, you'll be pleased to hear. But these are all uh, images that I've uh, generated and with other colleagues where we're looking at social behavior. We're not looking at solving problems and learning lists of languages, etc. We're looking at the consequence of social negative events. So, for example, social rejection, and this is measured by a very strange little video game, which some of you may have heard of, called Cyberball. When you're lying in the scanner, and there's two little cartoon figures throwing the ball to each other, obviously having a good time. And then the experimenter says, right, there's going to be your picture will come in into that video game, um, and they'll start throwing the ball to you, and um, let's see what happens in the brain. And you have a great time. And I've actually done this task, and, and these little figures, you know, cheer when you catch the ball, and then suddenly they stop throwing the ball to you. They just throw it to each other. They're obviously having a great time, and you're sitting there, you know, your little cartoon figure, waiting to be included, and you're not. You're being rejected. And even though you know that it's just a little video game, it does actually make you feel a bit kind of, huh, 
Um, and you can rate that huh, on a self-esteem scale, and you do actually show that the brain will change quite dramatically as your self-esteem drops. Um, and this is quite a powerful effect. Also, uh, other is issues associated with loss of self-esteem or being ranking where you feel you are in a social situation, um, if you're very self-critical, if you make a mistake. So these are all kind of negative social events, which can be measured by having very powerful effects on your feeling of self-esteem, you're feeling good about yourself. Now, what's intriguing in how powerful this is a driver in our behavior is that the same areas that are activated by, in fact, all of these are uh, uh, my little traffic light system, the same areas that are activated uh, by these social situations are uh, also the same areas that which are activated when you suffer real pain, if you have a broken leg or if you're unfortunate enough to be in the kind of lab which says, would you mind if I just give you a little electric shock, um, maybe a slightly bigger electric so shock, and carry on and just tell me when you've had enough. Um, and, and you will find that those areas... So, being rejected socially or being in a social situation where you're not part of your in-group is actually very powerfully negative and very likely to result in behaviour that will drive you away from that situation. Right, so moving on then, let's have a look at just briefly, this has behavioural consequences as well. So that if you suffer from um, any kind of social rejection, it actually means, may well result, and this is some of the... Uh, clinical work um, that I've been involved in for some time, which, again, <laughs> effectively it's saying that the kind of uh, behavioural changes that were associated um, with um, uh, these kind of changes in the brain means you might have a poor self-image, you're very sensitive to being rejected by an in-group or, uh, or, or being attacked by an out-group. You have high levels of self-criticism. And there's a form of behaviour called self-silencing, which is almost like you withdraw and feel that this is really not something for you. Now, these are actually sort of pathological conditions, but they do have echoes in the kind of behaviour which results if you have negative social experiences. OK, there's one more bit of the jigsaw before I get to the sort of uh, other parts of the talk, which is that all of this starts very, very early. And I think that's really important to remember in terms of what we're talking about, gender stereotypes, and why we should be interested. We used to think that, well, we know that human babies are um, dependent and helpless for far longer than the young of any other species. So we always assumed that they were uh, just fairly reactive. Obviously, they started to learn language, and they started to walk, and all, acquired all sorts of amazing skills. But we thought fairly early on they were sort of fairly passive, and they were just generally kind of noise-making machines, um, or food-absorbing machines, or generally disruptive sort of machines. Um, you can tell I'm a mother. Um, but we now know that actually babies arrive in this world as the most amazingly astute um, social observers. They can pick up social cues literally from when they're born. Uh, within hours, they're responding differently to the sight of a human face as opposed to a scrambled image. Um, within weeks, they recognize the difference between their own language and a, 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 a non-native language. And generally, they're picking up things which are very important for being members of society right from the very beginning. And I call them tiny social sponges. Um, and then pretty quickly, something else happens. By the age of about two, they're starting to pick up what they find is a very important cue in their social world, and that is gender. And I will come back to the term sex and gender. I'm aware we haven't gone into that in much detail. So from the age of about two up to the age of about four, children become very serious gen junior gender detectives. They really want to know what's a boy like, what's a girl like, what do boys play with, what do girls play with, what do they wear, etc. what kind of toys are for boys, what kind of toys are for girls. And it becomes very important. Um, if anybody's ever been in a nursery school, the children themselves are the, the worst kind of uh, policing of the dressing up box about who should wear what and who doesn't wear tiaras, etc. And generally what you're finding there is children are looking into the outside world, working out the clues, the in-group and the out-group clues, again, but with respect to gender in particular. 
And my claim is that, as we'll see shortly, this is because gender is something which is emphasised hugely in society as a very important differentiator of individuals. Going right back, if you like, to the idea of that, you know, the two-headed gorilla, etc., but the idea that there is a key difference between two sorts of individuals, uh, and that has consequences for you socially and educationally and what you might choose to do with your life. And by the age of about four or five, well, children have really um, uh, are showing what I call gender compliance, and we'll go into that in a bit, bit detail. But children at that age are saying, I'm a girl and this is what girls do. Or, I'm a boy and this is what boys do. So when we're looking at typically developing children, they have this um, skill to align themselves appropriately. Um, and that is very important when we realise it starts very early. So eventually, this is the kind of core bit of the message, and then we could stop there and carry on a bit, um, just with some examples. But I want to point out that what 21st century neuroscience has brought to this debate is that we now know that the human brain is affected much more by the world that it functions in than we ever realised. And therefore, in order to understand the brain and how the brain gets to be different, we need to look at that outside world. And this is where I got into the, the power of stereotypes and saying, well, let's have a look at the outside world. We know what changes the brain. Is there evidence in that outside world that certain groups of individuals are treated differently? And this is where you can, uh, we could stop here and, and generate our own list of, of, of gender stereotypes. But here's some examples which I've focused on because I think they're all key to understanding why it's important that we should look at this. Um, Welcome to the world of pointlessly gendered products. Um, and this is focusing on the idea that these, um, that talking about our tiny little social sponges and the pink and blue tsunami that we plunge them into. Um, and there is a rant in the book, I don't know if anybody's um, read it yet, about gender reveal parties. I don't know if anybody's quite right. <laughs> I'd never heard of them. They, they have started to emerge in the UK. I was actually looking for, and I hope there's no card manufacturers, those ghastly cards which you get when children are born. You know, it's a baby girl in pink, or it's a boy um, in blue, etc. And that's when I came across gender reveal parties. Now, I hasten to add, um, I, you obviously from your uh, res response, you know what they are, but the idea is that 20 weeks before humans arrive in this world, we're already signalling that it's important whether they're a male or a female. Now, I'm not saying, as one reviewer suggested, that a fetus is in some way affected by these gender reveal parties. <laughs> what I'm saying is that actually it gives a very important clue about how society stresses this as a difference. Although I do wonder about, there was one video, I got obsessed and I was looking at YouTube videos. There's one, very, oh, I think it's quite sad actually, there's three little girls who are clearly the siblings of this expected infant. Um, and there's a big party and eventually they cut the cake or release the balloons or whatever it is they're gonna do. And, and it, they're blue balloons or blue confetti big cheers and shouting and hurrahs, at last, at last, it's a boy. And you just kind of wonder the sort of feelings that that might engender, even in quite small children, uh, as to who's important in life or, or what's important. And there's various other ways in which the world continues to treat children differently. So you get these, the way in which boys and girls are dressed, slightly ill-advised baby growth or a baby girl. Um, and we get the classic uh, difference in toys and books where you get um, what is known as the, the kind of wave of pink and blue in toy, um, uh, toy shops, etc. Big move in the UK, let toys be toys, where people are constantly going into toy shops or, or criticising people producing catalogues because they very clearly signal that these toys are for boys, they're creative, etc. These toys are for girls, they're pink, princessy, um, and clearly expect children to, to want to play with things in a particular way. Now, is this important? Is this just a kind of bit of eye-rolling, you know, PC sort of thing? Well, I think it is, and I think this is a really nice example of, I mentioned before, the way in which the brain is changed by particular experiences, 
but also the brain is changed by not having those experiences. And this comes to the idea that um, there are, you know, there is a psychology has a kind of go-to list of um, the kind of things that men are good at, the kind of things that women are good at. I've already mentioned some of them. And one of the most powerful claim is that men are very, very good at spatial processing, much better, even if it's on average, than women, um, hence the map reading, but also hence the success in science. Being able to think spatially, to understand the relationships between objects, either mentally or in, 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 in real life, is claimed as a fundamental aspect of being a good scientist. And there's a task called the mental rotation task. There's lots of tasks for assessing this, but this is the classic one, where you get something like a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. You see these blocks here. Um, and then you have to say, are these two figures the same except for their orientation? So you have to take that one, you have to imagine it, switch it in your mind to see if it's actually the same as that one or is one of those arms actually sticking in a different direction. I have to say, stereotypically, I'm very, very bad at that task, but I am very good at parallel parking, so, you know, <laughs> there, is, there is some hope for us spatially incompetent. But more seriously, this has been claimed as a fundamental issue in science, as why there's an underrepresentation of women in science, which was mentioned in the introduction, something I'm interested in. There was a big survey done in the States where they took a large number of, of males and females, ran them through a whole battery of spatial tasks, and found, as, as had been predicted, in fact, a um, small but reliable difference where men perform better than female, males perform better than females. Then they took another measure. They took a measure of um, uh, spatial training opportunities. Did you play with construction toys as a child? What kind of uh, video games do you play? Uh, do you play video games a lot? How long do you play video games? Do you have, play a sport which involves some kind of um, hand-eye coordination, for example? And they found once they got that measure and applied it to the data, the sex difference disappeared. This is actually a measure of spatial opportunities, of spatial training. So then you say, well, if I'm interested in the differences between males and females, do males and females get different training opportunities? And this is where you can start to look at, for example, the kind of uh, games that boys characteristically are given, or it is assumed that they play. Um, so here's a map of Lego, um, very complicated diagrams. If any of you have done Lego, you know, you always have to turn them upside down at some point to put the wheels on, and then you turn them the other way around and the wheels fall off. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it is in itself a very good training opportunity. And an amazing training opportunity is... Um, the video games like Super Mario, and I, I give talks in schools and you can see the teachers rolling their eyes when I say these are amazingly good at spatial training. Um, but they are, uh, and, and that's actually been demonstrated behaviorally, and also it's been shown to change the brain. So you can actually show that if you get somebody to play Super Mario a lot, um, their spatial skills will improve and the brain processing of spatial information will also change. So that's important to remember. So am I being unfair in saying that, you know, this tends to be a male-female divide in who has access to these training opportunities? Um, so I'll just give some examples of Lego being aware that girls weren't playing with Lego, produced Lego friends, um, not as complicated, obviously, as the kind of Lego they did for boys, so bigger bits. Um, and the girls could actually do things like make hairdressing salons and poodle parlours. Um, but this is my favourite. Let's make sure we get it. Uh, that is Stem Barbie. Um, so Mattel, being aware of the underrepresentation of women in science, decided the solution was to produce Barbie the Engineer. Um, and this is Barbie the Engineer. Um, very, very short lab coat, even, <laughs> even shorter miniskirt underneath. It has got DNA patterns to show it's science-y. Um, surprisingly high heels for working in a lab. But then you also say, so what can Barbie Engineer make? You know, isn't this good that we're encouraging girls to be scientists? Well, actually, what Barbie Engineer can make is a pink washing machine, um, a pink jewellery carousel, and I think there's also a pink table for cutting out uh, dress patterns, etc. So just drawing your attention to the fact that possibly there is a difference in the training opportunities that children are offered. OK, and I'm going to move on um, through the next, which are just examples which all of you are probably familiar with. And that is the idea, not only that experiences differentiate boys and girls, but also expectations. And, for example, 
I think the back of this has fallen off, which is probably why it's not helping. Um, if we look at education, I, I was involved in a, a BBC programme a couple of years ago uh, called No More Boys and Girls, Can Our Kids Go Gender Free? And that was actually going into a class of seven-year-olds looking at the gender stereotypes that were evident there. Quite accidentally, you know, the boys had a, a blue cupboard for their coats and the girls had a pink cupboard for their coats. Uh, nobody knew why, they'd just always been like that, so they got the children to paint the, the cupboards orange and they could hang their coats where they liked. Um, it just seems minor, but there were all sorts of other examples. The teacher called the girls Sweet Pea and the boys Mate, um, and he tended to ask boys um, to do things like go out and play football or, or move things, and girls sit quietly in the corner and read stories. So there were issues that boys and girls were being treated differently, and, and interestingly, in this program, they removed all of that for six weeks and showed quite dramatic differences. But also within education, you'll find these differences emerging at rather sadly early years. And this was a teacher by a school looking at uh, primary school teachers in Israel, in fact, tended to overmark boys and undermark girls. And that particular bias score, against all the other factors like socioeconomic status, educational level of parents, etc., was shown to be a very powerful predictor of who would later choose to do science and, and mathematical subjects at high school uh, and in college. Um, another study showed that if you gave boys and girls a choice between toys which were, were for really, really clever people or for people who worked really, really hard, girls were much less likely to choose the toys for really, really clever people because they didn't believe they were really, really clever. So six-year-olds. Similarly, nine-year-olds talking about uh, maths being a boy thing and therefore they wouldn't do the girls, they wouldn't do maths because even though their performance level was quite often better than the boys, they didn't think that this was something they'd do. Okay, now I'm moving towards the end now because I'd like, it's always the questions are more interesting, I find. Um, so I'll just, again, give you an example of the way in which we need to look very carefully at how the world treats ourselves, uh, uh, boys and girls, women and men, in terms of what they might want to do. And this is a representation of issues associated, I feel, with the underrepresentation of women in science. Now, one of the most famous and probably best scientists that we've come across, Charles Darwin, had a very, very strong view about women. I'm afraid he was a brilliant scientist, but an absolutely arch misogynist. <laughs> Chief distinction of the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than woman can attain. And he believed that women were evolutionarily uh, lower down the evolution scale than men, and actually educating women would upset the progress of evolution. And you think, OK, 200 years, we've moved on. And yet all of these rogues gallery here, a scientist, male scientists, uh, in the last 15 years or so, who made claims that women were not suited to science, science shouldn't be wasting its money on educating women to do science because various ways of, 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 of describing it, biologically they were not suited to be doing science. So James Damore, the writer of the notorious Google memo, really felt that Google was wasting its money on diversity initiatives because um, distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part, very kindly, due to biological <laughs> causes. So there is clear evidence. If we know, um, and this is, and I'm, I'm going to skip over... <laughs> If, if it let me, it's going to stick on it. I was going to skip over the next slide, um, which is really the same issue, that even if women become successful in science, their achievements are described differently. Reminder, then, that if you are treated as inferior, rejected by an in-group, um, feel you're pretty low down a scale, that you're expected to be incompetent, this has fairly major changes, uh, brain-changing effects. And so what looked like sex differences, a bit like our, our, our spatial manipulation task, may well be something which is being brought about by other factors. I'm not in any way denying that there are, there are sex differences in the brain that have been described as a sex difference denier, but I think the emphasis we put on them and the fact that that's the end of the explanation rather than the beginning is something that we should really be thinking about very carefully. Um, 
And so the questions that I was interested in asking was really about, are there any sex differences in the brain? And I think the answer is actually none that really explain the amount of variance we see between males and females in terms of their behavior and their success and gender gaps in a whole range of areas. Um, where do they come from? Well, I think we need to revisit this kind of essentialist argument that there's a kind of biology being in the driving seat and saying, let's have a look at the other things in the world that may be affecting that brain. So we may land up indeed with a brain that is different. So the first message is a gendered world produces a gendered brain. The second message, um, having shown you all these amazing brain scans, I came across this fantastic drawing by a six-year-old who really sums it all up. Um, Everybody's brain is attached to the world, and I think that's really important for brain scientists and anybody who has any, any responsibility for a brain, including their own, um, to know that we should look at the world in understanding those differences. So brains reflect the lives they've lived. And the final slide, hopefully, is to say the choice is yours. You can, in fact, continue to believe in this essential difference, the mantra, let boys be boys, biology is destiny, and ally yourself with these sort of literature. Or hopefully you might, after now, <laughs> despite all the slides, think, well, perhaps we should look more carefully, have a kind of new, more nuanced approach, um, and understand how the world affects the brain. And I will just say, I don't know if there's any booksellers here. My students, uh, having tried this out on them, they, they wanted to be social justice warriors and go into bookshops and stick stickers on the books as helpful clues to people as to what they should buy. Um, so this one, I'll try this, this UK sense of humour anyway. Um, so that's what they wanted to put on these kind of books. <laughs> Whereas this one, helpfully, they put... This should be... At last, the truth. Thank you. <laughs> Stand you all into silence now. <laughs> I think the back. Hi again, Haley from Town Hall. Um, we will be doing a brief Q and A. We'll need to end things in about fifteen minutes. So if you'd like to ask a question, please keep your question short and concise. You can line up here or across the stage at the other corner, um, and I will call last question when we need to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um. I'd like to say I'm necessarily enriched by your presentation. Anyway, my question is, what does neuroscience teach us about that instant of decision-related criticality, the point when a person, perhaps with a history of a behavior or without, uh, does or does not engage in an act? Any particular act or just generally? Well, I used to work with offenders prior to my retirement. And sometimes when the environment or situation get, could be the same or similar, sometimes they would act and sometimes they would not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. there's a... I, I, I mean, it, it's almost an impossible question to really untangle. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping that this book is addressing is that we need, for example, to move beyond nature or nurture, to say it's either one or the other. And the reason it's... In, almost impossible to un unpick that, is that the p people we see in whatever the situation are bringing a history with them. So they're not exactly the same. You, you might say that situation is the same, but that situation will mean different things to different people for different reasons. So if it looks like a gender divide, it may well be a gender divide, but are we looking at something which is to do with a predetermined brain process or with a process, a brain process, which has been moulded by different kinds of explanations. Does that make sense? I'm just thinking about behaviour. Exactly. Well, as a brain scientist, all behaviour is determined by the brain. So I think if you see um, a behavioural, it could be decision-making, it could be withdrawing from a situation, it could be becoming much more involved in a situation, all of those, I think, are driven by the brain, but the brain has been moulded in particular ways. And I, I think that's, that's what we should be looking at to try and understand, you know, if that's pathological for individuals, for example, withdrawal or becoming depressed or whatever, then we need to understand that. But I think that's, that's what I, my message is. 
Hi there. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I noticed on slide four or five, I think it was, you talked about the prefrontal cortex being primarily activated, um, or humans being social creatures. And I was just curious if you had any insight in your research about how participation in online communities affects that social mm. that's center. A, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is we don't know yet. <laughs> um, but it's clear that uh, the kind of social rejection, as I say, remembering, in fact, that there was a sort of video game, actually, that, that uh, is, is a good measure of that. Um, whether or not you need the face-to-face -face contact, the eye contact, which is part of being social, or whether or not the awareness that you're part of a group because you can see avatars or, or uh, individuals, um, we don't know yet, and I think that's an important question. But it's interesting, for example, working with autistic individuals who find real people difficult to understand and difficult to interrelate, you can help them by putting them in a virtual reality situation, mm -hmm. which for some reason makes them feel safer. So it would be very interesting to see how that plays out in, in a typical community. Hi, um, I love your talk, first of all, and okay. as a woman in science, really appreciated the <laughs> nod to that. Um, so as you were talking, I just found, found myself feeling really curious about, you know, gender is not just a binary, it is a spectrum. And so I'm just curious if you can speak to the state of the literature about what we know for folks who identify as transgender and yeah. um, okay. across the lifespan. Yeah, I think um, it certainly has relevance. I do get asked about transgender issues a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an area I research in, so I'm quite cautious because I think it's such a complex that. area. Mm -hmm. um, a whole range of things. I certainly think that we need to move away from the idea, and I didn't talk at all really about sex, the difference between sex mm -hmm. and gender. Um, in fact, one of the explanation slides that kind of whizzed past at some point, um, the whole idea of the, the sort of biological sex, mm -hmm. that you know, whatever it is determines your anatomy also determines your brain. That, I would say, is the kind of biological sex. And the whole issue of uh, the roles that that means you can play is gender. It used to be that they were so... It was so determined that one was inextricably linked to the other. Mm -hmm. You only had one word, and it was, everything was known as sex. And then about the 1980s, they wanted to differentiate them, so you had sex or gender. Mm -hmm. And now I think you'll find that the word gender has taken over and actually means everything, including biological sex. Um, and there was a big row in the UK in the summer because um, there was some biology exam where children were asked about different chromosomes and asked how, how we know that chromosomes determine gender. Um, and there was a big Yikes. uproar about it. Apparently it was originally sex, but they thought that might confuse the children, so they put gender, <laughs> uh, which perhaps says it all. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that we need to get away from this binary. And in fact, even biologists are saying, you know, we used to think it was a nice, clear XX or mm -hmm. XY, but that really isn't the case. We're looking at a biological spectrum. Um, looking at the brain characteristics, if you look at all the data, there's no clear distinction, you know, reliably uh, aspect, which distinguishes males and females. Certainly there are sex differences associated to hormone receptors, etc. But the role that might play in behaviour and in society mm -hmm. um, is probably been overemphasised, definitely been overemphasised. Um, and similarly, the idea that you have a gender which is associated with your role in the world, the relationships you have, etc. It's, it's now that we're starting to unpack this link, gender could indeed be a spectrum. And I think that's what we're seeing now, where people are saying, actually, just because you're born a boy or you're born a girl doesn't mean you necessarily have to be masculine or feminine. This comes back to the kind of language issue as well. So I think the transgender issue is part of that. I think one of the problems is the... Um, remnants of this idea or the fixation on this idea that your biological sex is inextricably linked mm -hmm. to your gender so that if you feel some kind of disconnect that you don't feel you know you're assigned a male you're assigned a female at birth you actually don't feel male or female very often people assume that there is something wrong with the biology and that if you change the biology that will uh, resolve the puzzle, as it were. And there is evidence that that is not a wholly su successful solution. But I think what we can do is just, um, if you say, actually, there is no connection, yes, you're born a male or a female, 
but then you can be anything you like in terms of who you feel you wish to associate with or, or the role you feel you should play in life. I, I, I think that's an issue there. But I would say that I get into trouble because one of the aspects of individuals particularly who want to transition, and I, I don't want to trivialise this, but it's a sort of claim that you know I've been... Yeah, I've got a female brain in a male body or a male brain in a female mm-hmm. body. And then, of course, I come along and say, well, actually, there's no such thing as a female brain or a male brain. Mm. And I have had individuals who want to transition to say, could you scan my brain to show that it's actually a female brain if it's, mm. if it's a man? And I, I say, I've got no template to say, mm-hmm. you know, this is what it's like. Sorry, that was a long answer to that question. Great question. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question about um, the predispo or the suggestions. You, you mentioned um, that external suggestions determine how you do on exams or in um, problem solving, and I was um, I wanted to ask how how to counteract that. Um, Actually, um, knowledge, <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds trivial, but knowing that that can be a process can be very um, liberating, if you like. Uh, I mentioned maths anxiety in girls. Um, and very often, the understanding that your problems are arising from this external pressure, they're not to do with you being at fault. They're to do with an expectation that you'll make a mistake. And sometimes actually just empowering people, saying, remember, you know, there are situations in which you do well. So it doesn't mean you go and drill them with more maths. Just get them to understand that there are situations in which they can do well. And very often that can overcome even experimentally manipulated stereotype threat. So I think the knowledge that um, this can have an effect on you uh, certainly has been shown experimentally, at both behavior and brain level, uh, to be powerful. And, and getting rid of the stereotypes, too, would be quite useful. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> unpacking quite centuries of belief. <laughs> is, is that OK? Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that you're a mom. Yes. And I'm also a mom of uh, a boy and a girl. Um, and I'm just curious how your research has influenced your parenting. <laughs> you better ask my daughters that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saw one of them there. Um, uh, I think, in a way, I mean, as, 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 as people who work in this area, I, the one thing that really struck me, um, and my, my daughters were born in the 1980s and 90s, and that kind of coincided with uh, the second wave of feminism, when it was all to do with, it was all um, nurture, and then you just had to change society and anybody could be anything. Um, So I think the thing I focused on most was making sure that they never said they couldn't do something because they were a girl, um, or they're both girls, so (laughs) they said that. Um, And um, I did get into trouble. One of them never wore a dress till she went to... um, nursery school. My, my mother was very worried about that. Um, so I think there are issues there. I, yeah, I think it was really knowing... I mean, at that stage, I wasn't as sure as I am now about how profound these effects are. Because a lot of people think it's trivial, but actually even quite trivial bits add up. And certainly when you look at... Um, as I say, I do a lot of work on the underrepresentation of women in science. And when you look at the conscious... The unco- I was going to say unconscious, but also conscious bias against women in science. And when you put that together with the fact that being social is a very powerful driver in, in, in the human brain. Um, and if you look at pathological conditions like depression and eating disorders and self-harm, they're all associated with problems of self-esteem. Mm-hmm. So if you're in a world where, as I said, you, you're uh, expected to be inferior or incompetent or you're even invisible... Um, then that's going to have quite a powerful effect. I'm not sure I brought all of that to, you know, trying to deal with my <laughs> small daughters, but I, I did notice that that was important. And they, they do still remember that they, they, um, we have pink arguments quite a lot. <laughs> One of them's now got a boy, so it's quite interesting seeing that playing out differently. Or even the same, actually. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
That will conclude our Q&A. Okay. Thank you again so much for attending tonight. Uh, Dr. Rippon will be available in the library to sign your books if you'd like, and we have a bookseller as well in the cafe. Thank you so much.